Hi, I'm Cheryl Morales of the Newport News Tourism Office, and welcome to What's New in Newport News. Did you know that nothing happens until something moves? Well, that's a quote by Albert Einstein, and it's part of the motto of the United States Army Transportation Corps. Well, today we're at the United States Army Transportation Museum, the only museum dedicated to the history of the Army Transportation, and Matt Fraz, the educational specialist, is here with us to tell us all about this incredible free museum. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for coming, Cheryl. Well, I know Fort Hustis, or should I say Joint Base Langley Hustis, but you know, Fort Hustis will always be part of my heart, you yes. know. The history of that, of the land itself, goes back to like the 1600s. And Fort Hustis has its own history of over 100 years old. So I'm thinking our audience would like to know a little bit more about that. So can we do that before exploring the museum? Sure. Uh, historically, uh, the area today known as Joint Base Langley Eustis, or f the Fort Eustis part of it anyway, was known as Mulberry Island. And one of the most famous of those early settlers here on Mulberry Island was a man by the name of John Rolfe, otherwise known as the husband of Pocahontas, and the man who introduced tobacco as a cash crop here in Virginia. Now the land would be privately owned all the way up until 1917. Uh, the Army was looking to establish bases to train soldiers when we enter World War I, and this was a good place to do it. You had the Chesapeake and Ohio tracks just right off post. You've got the James River, which could be used for various purposes when it came to training. And so Fort Eustis, uh, then known as Camp Eustis, wasn't quite a fort yet. In military terms, it becomes a fort when it's permanent. So ah. this was designed to be a short-term thing, probably to last the war, and then they'd shut it down. But that wasn't the case. Yeah. <laughs> they would hold on to it. Uh, now, we weren't transportation during World War I. We were the Coast Artillery Training Center, Railroad Artillery to be exact, and the U.S. Army Balloon School. Balloons, that's interesting. Yes, they would put the, raise the big balloons up into the air uh, because those big ar guns wouldn't have anything to fire at if you can't see the target. So balloon up, people up there with binoculars trying to find something to shoot at. There you go. So all forms of transportation, really, the Army uses, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and it, it wouldn't be until after World War II in particular that we would become the home of the Transportation Corps. Ah. We would remain coast artillery and anti-aircraft artillery during World War II, and uh, transportation didn't come until World War II was over with. And what does it represent now? What, what actually happens here at the base? Well, we, we still have a big representation from the Transportation Corps. Uh, all the Army watercraft training mm -hmm. is done here as our port operations. A uh, large portion of the school is up at Fort Lee, but they don't have the watercraft up there, <laughs> water to be able to do watercraft training. Uh, you have truck driver training, which is out at Fort Leonard Wood. You have ports, you have forklift training, you have watercraft training, and we still do the occasional bit of railroad training here as well. Um, I also know something about TRADOC. What is, what is that all oh, about? Okay. Yes, Training and Doctrine Command. Mm. Uh, used to be headquartered down at Fort Monroe, but when they handed that over to civilian control, they moved it up to Fort Eustis. And what Training and Doctrine Command does is, well, as what its name states, it's, it determines how the Army is going to train for future conflicts and what it will do mm. <laughs> during any potential future conflicts. Well, busy base, yes, for sure. We are. Yes, it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, how did the, the museum then evolve? Well, the Army has always been a big believer in education. It uh -huh. believes that the soldier can learn a lot from what went on before them. Learn from both the good things, learn from the bad things, hopefully improve upon them, and then apply whatever lesson they come up with to whatever they're doing today. And starting in the 1950s, started founding museums. 
as a method of teaching soldiers about their history. Uh, the museum here at Fort Eustis was founded, I believe, in 1956. And like a lot of these museums, we start off on an old surplus army warehouse until we can raise them enough money to build something bigger, such as what you're seeing here today. And first part of the museum in this current location where we're at was built in 1976. Uh, other parts of it, we continue to expand. We have parts built in 2004, 2011. And as one of our former directors used to say, if the Army promises to quit fighting wars, then I'll quit trying to expand. And by the so museum. It's, it's, it's a constant <laughs> thing. The Army keeps doing things. We need the space. We'll yeah. keep seeing if we can get bigger. Well, you know, your exhibits, too, are on the larger side as well. So this incorporates both inside and outside. That is, that is correct. Yes, we have. Uh, inside, we go chronological from the American Revolution to the modern day. And we do have six acres of displays on the outside, mm. all of which are thematic. We have a section devoted to the railroad, section devoted to trucks, another one to aviation, and one to Army watercraft as well. well again, lots of modes of transportation, so yes. you have, you're covering it all. Yep, we have to try to make sure we do cover it all so people can see and learn what the Army has done over the years. Well, I guess that goes to my next question or storyline, mm -hmm. I should say. And I know you've been asked multiple times, what, why is it so important to, you know, keep history? To, to have a museum. And I know you've given a couple of stories, particular to a couple of exhibits mm -hmm. that you have here. Yeah. And one, this truck, this gun truck that, that is right here in our mm -hmm. scene, um, has a story in and of itself. Could, would you mind sh sharing that with our audience? Sure. Uh, the, the vehicle back is the Eve of Destruction, which is an armored five-ton gun truck I used on the roads of Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Mm. Now, the Eve of Destruction is a very rare and unique vehicle because it is the only one of its kind that made it back from Vietnam. Mm. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with them all being destroyed, because they weren't. Right. <laughs> As mostly to do with the fact in Vietnam, they were always an unofficial vehicle, hand-built by the soldiers whenever they felt they needed one. Mm. Well, when the war ends, well, we had a little bit of a supporter over there in Vietnam who made sure he picked one truck from his own unit and had it sent back. That is, of course, the eve of destruction. The rest of them were just turned back into regular cargo trucks. Mm -hmm. Well, about 30 years after the end of the Vietnam War, when we're getting started during the war in Iraq, uh, the Army is thinking about reintroducing a new method of convoy protection, the armored truck. But no one currently in the Army at the time knew much about the armored truck, much less how to use them properly. So the Army found out about the one that we have here, and they sent a team of experts down here to this museum. They spent a week going over every inch of that vehicle interviewing the veterans who built it and the veterans who operated it all so that they knew how to use them properly and how to build them properly for use during the war in Iraq. So yeah. something that was thought to be 30 years out of date still served a pretty useful purpose in a modern war. Absolutely, and thank God we re preserved that history so that, again, they can, they can learn you know, from it and better themselves from it. So it is a great asset to have for the Army. Do um, other posts or forts have museums too? Is it on every base or...? Yes, there are Army museums on every base. Oh. Uh, not just active Army, but a lot of nat state National Guards will have these museums as well. All total, there's over 40 Army museums scattered around the country, and even a few of them overseas. One over in Germany and one over in Korea. And so they would be uh, niched to whatever their 
Exactly. Okay. They that the museum will cover what that particular location is best known for. If it's active duty, sometimes it covers the division that's there. Uh, sometimes it covers, like us, what it's best known for when it comes to training or a particular branch of the Army. And, of course, the National Guard museums will cover the history of military activity by state troops. I see. So really, when you're out visiting um, other locales, you should really stop by and there, check these out. There's probably one nearby. And if some of the, the bigger bases even have more than one museum wow. that you can visit while you're there. <laughs> Here yes. you go. And are they also free to the public? Yes. Uh, we being federal government museums, there was never an admission fee to any one of them. Well, there's a lot of years that have to be covered, you know, in this museum. And mm -hmm. I know you start in the Revolutionary War and work your way to present day. So can you give us a little example about things we might see? Sure, not a problem. Uh, in the Revolutionary War, uh, we have a Conestoga wagon, uh, which is a horse-drawn wagon, your first major form of Army transportation. Now, out of all of the vehicles in this museum, that one is the only one that is not original. That is a reproduction. Uh, it was built in 1976 up at Yorktown Battlefield mm -hmm. for their 200th birthday celebrations up there. And when they were done, they donated it here to us. Uh, we proceed on through World War One. Uh, we were still using wagons, so we still have a wagon, but also the Army is using trucks at the same time. We have a Liberty Standard B truck. Uh, World War Two, boy, you name it, we've <laughs> we got it for World War Two. Uh, Jeeps, cargo trucks, uh, big tank haulers. And we decided, even though it's not transportation, since we had a tank hauler, well, why not get a tank to put on the back of it? You even have transportation that uh, floats on water, yep. in a sense. And it's not even a boat at that. It's a, tr it's a truck. <laughs> a D-U-K-W, uh, better known as the Duck, uh, could mm -hmm. operate on both water and land and used to transport men and cargo from ships anchored off a beach to a short little distance going inland. Is that what we see in some cities now for tours? Oh, yes. The duck. Yes. yes. Okay. And all, pretty much all of your major coastal cities that depend on water for some part of their tourism, even inland, uh, they have it at the Wisconsin Dells, for example. People will offer duck tours, and you can, if you ever go to any of these places, you can ride on an old World War II era duck. Of course, it's probably been refurbished a little bit to make it safer for the, <laughs> the modern person. <laughs> uh, well, then we can move on to the war in Korea. Now, Korea, mm -hmm. first time we use helicopters on a large scale, so that's when helicopters will first start to show up. During the Cold War, we would also use some pretty uh, science fiction looking kind of things. Uh, we have a jet pack. The Army experimented putting rockets on somebody's back. Didn't work very well, but they tried. <laughs> I would be not scared to be that person trying. <laughs> oh my. Yeah, it's, uh, it was kind of hazardous, which is one of the reasons why it was never adopted. Mm. Uh, here in Vietnam, of course, we have the Eve of Destruction that I already mentioned. Uh, also, we have probably the most famous piece of Army uh, equipment, especially when it comes to aviation, the UH-1 Iroquois, better known as the Huey helicopter. Mm -hmm. You can't see a movie or a documentary about Vietnam without that helicopter playing a prominent role. And then we also, we move on through the war on terror. Uh, mm -hmm. We have lost some large cargo trucks, up armored vehicles. Uh, some vehicles were too thin skinned for serious combat. So the army began to add armor to it for better protection. Mm -hmm. And eventually we have such uh, newer forms of transport from the war on terror. Uh, such as the MRAP, the Mine Resistant Ambush Protected Vehicle. And we have an example of the newest form of Army ground transportation, the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, or JLTV for short. 
It is just now coming into service and we have one of the early prototypes, one of the ones they used for testing before they finally said yes to accepting it. Very good. And, and that's just inside. And these are the whole vehicle that you have. It's, it's amazing <laughs> to me, the, yes, the exhibits. Yes, they, they do take up a lot of space on the inside, uh, but we try to uh, put them in a display that puts you in the scene itself, Absolutely. the way the vehicle would have been used is the way we have it set up inside as well. Absolutely, you really feel like you are there in, in being a part of it, but you can see it so close up too, which is so nice. As well as, you know, going outside. You mentioned that earlier, um, but give us some highlights about okay. the, the outside sections right. that you have. Well, in the railroad section, uh, we have everything from steam locomotives up to uh, diesel electric locomotives. Uh, that's where we have some of our bigger trucks is out in the rail section. There is also the only combat hovercraft ever oh. used by the Army used in Vietnam. Uh, trucks, uh, we have an example of every Jeep from the very first type all the way up through the Humvee. So mm -hmm. there's about six different types of varying sh uh, for shapes and forms out there. Out in the uh, watercraft area, we have a vehicle known as the Lark, Lighter Amphibious Resupply Cargo. Good old Army acronym <laughs> there. <you> there. Go. <laughs> right. Army does it all the time. Uh, and it floats on land and water, uh, on water and then drives on the land, excuse mm -hmm. me. And there's the biggest amphibious vehicle that we have is called the Bark, Barge Amphibious Resupply Cargo, and it weighs 60 tons. Wow, and it floats. <laughs> and it floats, <laughs> That's yes. That's crazy. Meant to carry the big stuff, which is what the Army wanted. Uh, out in the aviation section, we have mm. a lot of fixed wing aircraft plus additional helicopters. Uh, one of the helicopters is the first Army helicopter, or actually first helicopter of any kind, to fly to the geographic South Pole. Mm. Uh, we have a helicopter that was used to fly around both President Eisenhower and President Kennedy. For at one point, the Army also had the responsibility of flying around the President by helicopter, even though now it's only a Marine job. Uh, we have the example of the third Chinook ever built for the U.S. Army. Uh, came to us, again, through roundabout ways, but we were able to get it restored when a company who does this kind of restoration for the Army in general said they wanted a good, us to have a good-looking Chinook, so using their own money, they hauled it up to Delaware, repaired it, brought it back, and put it on display. And I might add, that is the only one you can actually get into. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you, oh, fun. They've left the back open so you can actually get part of the way into the Chinook so you can see what it looks like inside that kind of okay. helicopter. Okay. And also, out in the aviation section, we have even way more experimental stuff that the Army tried, but it never worked. Uh, there's the Curtis Wright Air Car, a car that floats on a cushion of air. Uh, we, we always compare it to the land speeders out of the Star Wars movies because it's almost the exact, almost looks exactly the same. Yeah. And there is another vehicle out there called the Air Jeep, uh, meant to fly 3,000 feet in the air and drop bombs. Oh, interesting. But in it's a Jeep. Not, not a yeah, it's called yeah. a Jeep. It has wheels and it lifts up into the air. But it's not a helicopter, not quite anyway, not a fixed wing aircraft. It's its own unique little thing. But neither one of those two things, and there are more I might add, would ever actually see service. They were good, a good idea, but not good in practice. You just never know until you actually go through that whole process. That You're is right. True, yeah. Yes. Um, back on inside, there is one room we haven't really even talked about, and that's the regimental room. Yes, the regimental room is right up uh, as you enter the museum, and we use that room for multiple purposes. Uh, we have military units who use it for class. 
Uh, there's graduations that go on in there, retirements. And I, those are just the military events. Uh, we do sometimes, I say rent it out, but there's no actual charge for it. We rent it out to we, the general public as well. If they want to have something in there and they're willing to come on to Fort Eustis, then we will be more than happy to let them uh, use it. Now, it's not just a regular standard modern looking room. Mm. Uh, we wanted to make sure that that room looked even a little bit historical. So we designed it to look like a 1920 uh, regimental room, is what you mentioned, is what it's called, but it's a place where officers would gather together at the end of the day and do stuff that they do at the end of the day to relax. <laughs> sure. Uh, but we put historical pictures up along the wall. Uh, we have four display cabinets with rotating displays of historical uniforms that are in there as well. An exhibit in and of itself, absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So even if they don't see the rest of the museum, they get at least a little bit of history while they're using the room. So throughout the year, the Transportation Museum uh, offers some special events too. Can you tell us more about those? Sure. Uh, we have two major events uh, during the course of the year. Our biggest one is our Night at the Transportation Museum Halloween event. Uh, of course, based on the Night at the Museum movies that came out a few years back. Now, it's not meant to be a scary event. We wanted to make this a family-friendly event. Uh, we redecorate the museum in more of a Halloween fashion. Uh, we have multiple volunteers who will dress up in historical uniforms, place themselves in the displays, and they interact with the groups as they're coming through and hand out candy as well. We started the Halloween event in 2010, wow. and the first year we probably had maybe three to 400 people show up. And now it has become the looked forward to event here in the Fort Eustis community with a thousand or more people showing up in just four hours. Mm. Uh, we've also started a holiday event as well. Uh, we'll again sort of redecorate the museum in more of a holiday fashion. People will come in, hopefully feel the spirit. It'll be some, uh, some candy that they'll get as they leave the museum. Well, there are some requirements to enter the base, and now that we've gotten everybody excited to come see you all, can you go through the process and as well as talk about your hours of operation? Now, it's not as difficult as a lot of people would seem to think to get on to Fort Eustis, but there are a couple of security checks you will have to go through before getting in to see us since we are right inside the main gate. Uh, when you come to visit us, your first stop should be at the Fort Eustis Visitor Center, which is a brick building uh, right before you get to the main gate. Anyone 16 or over will need to have a photo ID. They'll give you a day pass, and then they'll send you over to the vehicle inspection area. Now there, they will do their vehicle inspection. They'll give you the instructions. To get both of those done usually doesn't take any longer than 10 minutes. Great. Now, we are open six days a week, Monday through Saturday from 9 o'clock until 4.30. Oh, fantastic. Well, Matt, I'm afraid we're out of time at this point, but I really want to thank you for being on, well, letting us come to the museum and tape this. It's been a pleasure, and it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for coming, Cheryl. We do appreciate it. And thank you for joining us today. For more information about this museum and all the great things that you can see in Newport News, go to our website at newport-news.org or check out our Facebook and Instagram. Or stop by our visitor center. It's located at the entrance of the Newport News Park where our travel counselors are eager to show you all the treasures that can be found in Newport News. Again, thanks for watching.